The aim of the team designing the new Queen Elizabeth is to recapture the golden age of the 1930s and its Art Deco style, but with a contemporary feel. The Queen's nephew, David Lindley, and designer Mark Blanchard are creating an 18-foot high marquetry panel for the midships lobby. We started with um, some sketch ideas here, um, and we really wanted to incorporate classic Art Deco style, and we wanted the, the cruise liner to be a central part of the panel. Lindley's creation, which shows the new liner straddling the world, uses bird's eye maple, burr walnut, black American walnut, Macassar ebony, and satin walnut. The classic Art Deco veneers, which were used in the 1930s Queens. You know, it's an enormous object. It's also a sense of tradition and heritage, and to do with the country, you know, anything else like that. So we're delighted to take part, and uh, hope we're up to the job. And in Britain, artists are working on commissions for the new ship. At Nether Compton in Dorset, Harley Crossley's task is the official portrait. My first ever job um, was uh, in the Ocean Terminal in Southampton Docks. And I was a, a messenger and clerk in there. And when I think back, all these giant ocean liners, you used to see them every day. In Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, United States, France, Norway. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, absolutely fabulous. During the lunch hours, I'd go and sit on a bollard and do a quick sketch and sort of uh, hope somebody would come along and say, here yeah, lad, how much do you want for that, you know? And I, and I found that uh, on a good week, I could earn more during the lunch hour than I could working for the company. <laughs> Cunard also invited entries from new artists for a sculpture to stand in the Queen's roof. The winner was a 20-year-old student from Edinburgh, Peter Simpson. His inspiration was the lenses developed for lighthouses by French physicist Augustin Jean Fresnel. See, a traditional lighthouse lens was shaped like a semicircle like this, whereas a Fresnel lens was cut at certain angles that meant that light transferred um, just as well through it, but was a lot lighter. So I wanted to kind of transplant these angles and take them onto a simple form that was just distilled to its absolute essence. Peter Simpson's competition winning sculpture is off to California to be cast at full size and then shipped on to Italy. The Grand Lobby is almost ready to receive the 18 foot high marquetry panel designed by David Lindley. Lindley is due to deliver in four weeks, but that's at risk because the panel sections are only now being cut at a workshop in Wiltshire. Craftsman Michael Beckingham is working with a range of contrasting wood veneers to put together a picture of the Queen Elizabeth conquering the world. On this section I've just done is just here overlooking the bow of the boat. As you can see it is made up of light grey sycamore and black stained sycamore as well and it's got some Macassar ebony stringing going around the outside for the detail. Working on such a big piece of art brings unusual challenges. I'm having to kneel on these foam pads so I don't damage the actual face, as this is the side that the passengers will be able to actually see. David Lindley's panel is a mix of traditional skills and high technology. When the computerized laser has cut all the pieces and Michael Beckingham has assembled them, it will be glued, heated and pressed and left for 24 hours to set. David Lindley's aunt, the Queen, is also contributing to the ship which will bear her name. She agreed to sit for a new portrait. The commission went to 31-year-old Isabel Peachy. Talking to the Queen means that actually you don't, at the end of the day, get a lot of, a lot of time within that hour to do the sketching. So I attempted sketching but in the end found that photography was the best way to get as much information as possible so that when I came back to the studio I had images to work from. Britain's royal family has had a long connection with Cunard. In 1946 the young Princess Elizabeth accompanied her mother on board the first Queen Elizabeth for her sea trials. 
The Second World War had interrupted the ships fitting out, but now, in peacetime, the Queens Elizabeth and Mary at last began the long-awaited weekly transatlantic service. Every Wednesday, one of the ships left either Southampton or New York. They'd arrived the following Monday, the opposite side, two days for refuel and reprovision, and bought new passengers and sailed again. Because they were earning so many dollars, they were making money. In the austerity of post-war Britain, the Queens were an oasis of treats, if you could afford them. I was in England until 1947, and when you boarded the ship on the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth, there were suddenly things you hadn't seen in Britain for a long time, like white bread, all the butter you wanted, not margarine. So these were immensely successful ships. Fast, smart, beautifully run, and uh, delivered on a weekly mail service. But the good times wouldn't last. With the arrival of jet aircraft in the late 1950s, passengers started to desert the Queens. On some winter crossings to New York, there were just 15 regulars in first class. In 1967, the venerable Queen Mary was sold to Long Beach in California and became a floating attraction and hotel. The Queen Elizabeth ended up in the hands of a Chinese businessman who planned a floating university. But in January 1972, the ship which had been the pride of Britain's merchant fleet mysteriously caught fire in Hong Kong Harbor. She burned out in Junk Bay and I went to see her. I drew pictures of her. Uh, two funnel ship lying on its side and I could show my children the ship on which they'd crossed many times now lying drunkenly rusted derelict on its side and a terrible sight Cunard commissioned a second Queen Elizabeth also built on the Clyde and fit for the swinging 60s she was a transatlantic liner and also a cruise ship to meet a new demand from a more affluent world. Like the earlier queens, the QE2 became a national icon. But after nearly 40 years in service, she was too costly to operate, too expensive to refit. But the QE2 will be remembered on the new Queen Elizabeth. Robert Lloyd is painting a special moment just before she was retired in 2008 when Cunard's three great modern queens lined up. This is a, a historical depiction of when the uh, QE2, uh, the Queen Mary II and the Queen Victoria met together in Southampton a couple of years ago. This was an evening type view and uh, quite atmospheric, which is something I wanted to try and reproduce with the painting. In time for the handover to Cunard on the 30th of September. Over the past three months, the transformation has been remarkable. The staircase between the two levels of the Britannia restaurant. The restaurant itself. The Royal Court Theatre. And the Grand Lobby. For so long a mass of scaffolding, but now the very heart of the ship, complete with David Lindley's marquetry panel. The winning entry in the national competition, Peter Simpson's sculpture, is also in place. The art installations are complete, with one exception. Isabel Peach's portrait of the Queen, unveiled in London at the end of September. It will be added to the ship at Southampton, which, if the delivery voyage goes to plan, will be in just 10 days' time. But soon, paying passengers will command every minute. Ahead lies Southampton and the maiden voyage. Cunard Line have been running their transatlantic liners in particular out of Southampton since before the Second World War. Both Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary ran from Southampton to New York. It is Southampton that is painted on the stern of this magnificent vessel and so we have a great affinity with the city and a great history going back all those years.
On the morning of Friday, October the 8th, the Queen Elizabeth enters British waters. Then the traditional welcome for a new ship from Southampton's tugs. The artists, like Harley Crossley, whose work is now on display, can see it in situ for the first time. Sometimes you look at your painting and you think, oh, I don't know, it's not quite as good as I expected, but this, this is better than I expected. I'm delighted with it. Upstairs in the Commodore Club is Robert Lloyd's huge mural of Cunard's three previous queens meeting in Southampton. At the last minute, Isabel Peach's portrait of the Queen is hung in the Grand Lobby. At 3.30, on Monday, October the 11th, the Queen herself arrives. And then, 464 days after the keel was first laid, Queen Elizabeth is officially christened. I name the ship Queen Elizabeth. May God bless her and all who sail in her. The fact that Her Majesty was here now for the third Queen Elizabeth, it's just an amazing piece of uh, heritage for us and something that we can take with us forevermore. This great project of building a 92,000 ton liner in record time for its size and type has succeeded just 15 months from start to finish. Within 24 hours, passengers on the maiden voyage are welcomed into the Grand Lobby. They have no idea of the sweat, love and tears that have gone into the latest of Britain's greatest ships. Thank you.